Encouraged by the reversal of abortion rights in the United States, a coalition of evangelical Christians, far-right politicians and Russian oligarchs are now engaged in a fierce campaign against progressive liberal values in Europe. But what's driving this so-called moral crusade and who is funding it? Reporter Sarah Spiller has been in search of answers. It was billed as one of the most important events of its kind in the world. Last September in Mexico, delegates gathered for the World Congress of Families and they were on a mission. A mission to roll back women's abortion rights, to challenge LGBTQ equality and to defend what they see as the sanctity of the family. En Occidente, verdaderamente vivimos una guerra, una guerra civil. Una guerra por los valores, por las ideas, por las creencias y por las costumbres. This is nothing less than a crusade in defense of traditional Christian orthodoxies against progressive liberal values. En el fondo es una guerra religiosa, una guerra espiritual. A crusade that has linked American evangelical Christians, Russian oligarchs and far-right politicians like Italy's Matteo Salvini and Giorgia Maloney. Le avete manché uno scandalo che c'è qualcuno che voglia difendere la famiglia naturale fondata sul matrimonio, che voglia incentivare la natalità, che voglia dare il giusto valore alla vita umana. Emboldened by the reversal of abortion rights in America, Conservative campaigners see Europe as the next key battleground. If we talk about the family being under attack, the epicenter of this is, is in Europe. Said in Europe that the governments, they don't want you to get married and they are anti-children. You are supposed to be gay or you are supposed to be diverse. We are building armies in all the major cities across the world to fight, to speak out and to witness. That call was taken up by conservative Christians in Russia, keen to make common cause with the West's moral crusaders. So we set out to investigate this movement of European conservative moral activists and trace the millions of euros, rubles and dollars which has helped fund its moral crusade. The places where this comes from three main geographic sources. First of them is the United States, accounting for just over 80 million. Second source is the Russian Federation, about 188 million. And then the third source is Europe itself, 437 million. Our journey began in a European country seen by the conservative right as showing the way forward. Poland has a near total ban on abortion, and those who defy that ban risk imprisonment under strict state laws. Justyna Wedinska works with fellow activists in a group which counsels women on how to safely find help with abortion. We met her the day before a court case, which could see her jailed for up to three years. What will happen maybe tomorrow will be the beginning of, like, the witch hunt. Justina's ordeal began during the COVID pandemic in 2020. She was contacted by a woman who said she was the victim of domestic abuse, trapped by the lockdown and desperately needed help with an unwanted pregnancy. Justina sent the woman her own abortion pills. It is a thing that every decent person would do, in my opinion. Mm -hmm. And also this was the safest and recommended method of abortion. But that act resulted in Justina being accused of aiding an abortion. I was really, really scared. I, uh, I cried here like the two days. Activities, they, they, they use us uh, as a tool to make other women afraid. 
The day after our meeting, Justina was back in a heavily guarded court where she faced not just the state prosecutor, but also this man, Jakob Sloniowski. So who is Jakob Sloniowski and why was he there? To find the answer, I began here, the Collegium Intermarium, a private university in Warsaw which trains lawyers in conservative ideals. It was set up by a legal foundation called Aldo Juris, and the court has allowed Aldo Juris, represented by the lawyer Sonioski, to participate in Ustina Brzezinska's prosecution. In their Warsaw HQ, I asked Aldo Juris's president what he wanted to happen to Justina. We hope uh, that uh, the lady will be uh, punished by, uh, by the court if anybody uh, pro promotes campaigns to take the life of the unborn. Uh, we need to provide proper sanctions in the criminal law. Meanwhile, back at the trial, key witnesses failed to appear and the judge rescheduled the hearing. I'm very disappointed and, uh, and I have to find a courage. Outside the court, activists called out what they see as Ordo Juris's mission. A sustained attack on women's right to abortion. And Justina pledged to keep supporting women who need her group's help. If anybody will need it, we will do, no matter what the circumstances are. But Ordo Juris's battle to enforce Poland's law, which only allows terminations in cases of rape, incest, or when a woman's life is in danger, has now extended to Ukrainian refugees. On their website, they say they sent letters to hundreds of Polish hospitals to find out if they were providing abortions to refugees from Ukraine. The letter asks if doctors were taking required legal steps to ensure women were telling the truth they'd been raped. Abortion is an abortion even if you come from a war zone. An abortion is an act of, uh, act of killing of an innocent person. And according to the Polish law, and those are only rare exceptions to this general principle, the constitutional principle of protection of life. In their self-ordained role as guardians of Poland's stringent abortion law, Ordo Juris has been seen as a flag bearer for Europe's moral crusaders. So just how do the organizations in that broader crusade operate and how are they funded? In Brussels, we met a man who's been looking hard for answers to those questions. Neil Data and his colleagues began their research by following the money. They identified all the different organisations which were active in contesting abortion rights, women's rights, contraception, LGBT rights, viol uh, laws on violence against women, and then tracked down their financial details, their annual reports, audited accounts, etc. Over a 10-year period from 2009 to 2018, uh, I was able to find that there is at least over $700 million going into this movement in Europe. For LGBTQ activist Bart Staczewski, this movement felt like a real threat. So in 2016, he wired himself up with a hidden camera to attend a conference with the title Agenda Europe. This is the first time he's spoken about what happened. The guests were welcomed at a gala dinner. I would like to especially greet our special guests, members of the government and the parliament of Poland, the more I was there, it was a few-day conference, the more I could understand that there is a very special meeting, especially when we see on how high-level those participants were. Attendees included people from right-wing and anti-abortion groups from Spain to Croatia, and they were all given a warning. We ask you to keep your this strictly confidential. When they were uh, speaking out about uh, tactics you need to use to win the battles, uh, the, the language you need to use, the rhetoric uh, tools you need to use, I seen the PowerPoint presentation which was quite obvious that they don't want to have a, like an equal discussion with us, they just want to win. 
Agenda Europe's online blog later published this document, which they claimed showed how the abortionist, the homosexualist and the eugenicist agendas are part of one and the same ideology. We are not an ideology. We are human beings that deserve to, to be treated equally. The document reads like a manifesto, calling for everything from anti-sodomy laws to bans on abortion, contraception and IVF. And it notes we should not be afraid to be unrealistic or extremist in choosing our policy objectives. But perhaps the most significant idea was its call for the creation of a network which must be capable of acting at the level of each country as well as globally. We don't know if this idea was adopted by Agenda Europe. What we do know is that an informal network which looks like this has continued to grow in strength. It's a loose informal network of organisations that want to undermine human rights in relation to sexual and reproductive rights and LGBT issues. They meet, they exchange ideas, they brainstorm. Data's organisation, which is funded by the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation amongst others, calculated that at least $700 million was spent in Europe in a 10-year period to 2018. It suggested around 80 million of that came from the United States, and tax filings show US dollars have continued to pour into Europe from various sources. If we take a look at the American money, for example, we can see that that $80 million is really concentrated in a few organizations which have specific, a, a very specific specialty, that of litigation on social issues, such as um, uh, abortion, what they call religious freedom, LGBT rights, children's rights. The woman who opened the Agenda Europe meeting in Warsaw is Sophia Kubi, a director of Alliance Defending Freedom International an organisation with offices and capitals across Europe. It's backed by its US counterpart, which has poured millions into the European offshoot. Money, they say, used for faith-based legal advocacy. Their website boasts of many successes. But when we emailed and even called at the ADF's Strasbourg office to ask about their work, they declined to take part. Another conservative faith-based legal foundation that's received large sums from the US is the European Centre for Law and Justice, led by French jurist Grigor Popink. We, fellow conservatives, are the only ones who can save human rights from self-destruction. Because we accept that God exists. Mr. Popping's foundation issues legal opinions, represents clients, and mounts challenges in the European Court of Human Rights. He was also unavailable for an interview. But not all litigation relies on US funding. In Poland, leaked emails show how Ordo Juris uses its legal actions, such as the prosecution of abortion support worker Justyna Wojcinska, to raise local funds. Polish LGBTQ activist Kamil Machuga has also found himself at the centre of Ordo Juris supported litigation. What is concerning is that they are using the legal ways to, um, to threat the activists. The action arose after activists published this online map of local municipalities, arguing that some had passed resolutions which discriminate against LGBTQ people. With the support of Ordo Juris, several of those regions are now suing for defamation, demanding financial penalties and public apologies. The demands are um, extreme, like 20,000 lot per each uh, case. Ordo Juris was originally set up with financial help from another Polish group, the Pietraskarga Institute. We are very grateful to them. What, what, what did they do was to provide us with the initial funding, to provide us with uh, fundraising know-how. Based in Krakow, the Pietraskarga Institute is aligned with an international network of affiliated organisations known as Tradition, Family and Property. They believe in restoring 
not just traditional values, but also hereditary nobility to positions of power. They're also amongst the most significant funders of anti-choice and anti-LGBTQ equality in EU countries. TFP Student Action will continue the crusade for the family. The left can do what it will. With great confidence, those fighting in this spiritual crusade for moral values will never retreat, but march forward under the standard of tradition, family, and property. Neil Dadda's team estimate they've spent as much as $113 million over a 10-year period. The TFP movement itself is a great initiative, a Catholic initiative of uh, lay people from all over the world, privately founded by, as I believe, tens of thousands of families. But Dada and his team believe they've tracked the source of an even larger amount of money, the $188 million they say was raised in the Russian Federation, spent there and in Western Europe on initiatives with a conservative moral agenda. Uh, the $188 million is linked to the um, entities, legal entities, such as foundations, think tanks, media outlets, etc., that belong to two Russian oligarchs, Vladimir Yakunin and Konstantin Malafyev. Uh, both oligarchs were at one point very close to the Kremlin. Both men were sanctioned over Russia's invasion of Crimea. Yakunin has been sanctioned again this year and Malofiev indicted by a US court. A spokesperson for Yakunin confirmed representatives from one of his foundations attended some WCF conferences, but denied this foundation or Yakunin personally have funded pro-life, pro-family activities in Europe. A Russian who played a key role in the story is this man, Alexei Komov, seen here at a conference of the right-wing Italian party, Lega Nord. This is a matryoshka, typical Russian doll, and uh, as we know, God has created man first and then woman out of a man. Cinque bambini. Mr. Komov told me how he'd sought to create a link between Europe's moral crusaders and the pro-Kremlin oligarchs. We were hearing back then, uh, 12 years ago or so, uh, many alarming news from the West about those gay parades being imposed and all those uh, things. And we thought, no, 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 there must be some Christians and uh, pro-family people, and we need to find them. You were saying that you managed to get um, the influence and financial support of, of leaders in Russia, like Mr. Yakunin and Mr. Malavir. How, how important were they in terms of your vision and your project? Well, uh, I had this vision that uh, uh, we should uh, actually make Russia uh, the defender and protector of those values, and we should declare it internationally. And this was uh, my idea. Uh, and uh, I was speaking to any people wh whom I could reach, including some of influential uh, people whom you mentioned. So Mr. Komov looked for a forum where his vision could find fertile ground. We came across World Congress of Families, which uh, is probably the largest platform that unites uh, uh, you know, pro-family, pro-life people from over 80 countries of the world. Uh, we in Russia uh, share those traditional values with you, and you share them with us, so let's uh, be friends and do something. The Russian involvement quickly became clear. An opening speech at the 2012 World Congress was delivered by Natalia Yakunina, then president of the Russian Sanctity of Motherhood program and wife of oligarch Vladimir Yakunin. The next World Congress was scheduled to take place in 2014 in the Kremlin in Moscow, which Komov helped plan. The Russian invasion of Crimea saw the Congress drop its official affiliation. But a conference still went ahead with many of the same players. We have uh, organized a large and wonderful congress uh, in Kremlin, within Kremlin walls, in the main number one hall, Kremlin Hall, where parties of the Communist Party of Soviet Union used to be held. And now we had, uh, in 2014, uh, our congress, and uh, people were amazed. And to try to explain At the World Congress in Georgia in 2016, Alexei Komov himself was a key speaker. And God willing, if we are strong together, we will be victorious. Thank you and goodbye. Recently in Russia, 
President Vladimir Putin has been ramping up his socially conservative credentials, contrasting them with Western degeneration. Диктатура западных элит направлена против всех обществ. Такое полное отрицание человека, неспровержение веры и традиционных ценностей, подавление свободы приобретает черты религии наоборот, откровенного сатанизма. У нас здесь, в нашей стране, в России, вместо мамы и папы был родитель номер один, номер два, номер три, совсем с пятью уже. Vladimir Putin's speech on September 30th uh, was a very powerful one. It should be heard by uh, people in America, Europe, Africa, uh, Asia, because he, he had uh, addressed all those uh, audiences. On the very day that Putin made that speech, Spanish lawyer Ignacio Arzuaga addressed the Congress of Families in Mexico. Los progresistas son los que quieren imponer el aborto libre la sexualización de los niños, la ideología de género en las escuelas. Ignacio Oswaga is the founder of a high-profile social media platform with a cheerful public face called Citizen Go. If you're watching this video, it's because you're committed to defending life, family and liberty. With branches across Europe and the world, Citizen Go promotes hundreds of petitions via its online platform. When any of our shared values comes under attack, we generate a petition aimed at the... Citizen Go says its revenue, nearly $5 million in 2021, is raised wholly from small online donations. But letters uncovered by WikiLeaks reveal that when our swaga was originally setting up Citizen Go in 2013, an agreement was drafted with a foundation established by Russian oligarch Konstantin Malofiev. Under that agreement, Malofiev's foundation would pay 100,000 euros to Citizen Go. And as part of the deal, a representative of Malofiev's foundation would be appointed to the board of Citizen Go. At the time, Alexei Komov was involved with Malofiev's foundation, so I asked him about the proposed deal. Tell us about that. What happened then? Uh, there, there were no financing uh, by Russians of Citizen Go. Zero, okay. never. There was an agreement drawn up in June 2013. Are you saying that those... I mean, Nothing happened, in, in, yes. So Komov insists unequivocally that the financial aspect of the proposed deal came to nothing. Citizen Go also stated that it has never received money from any Russian oligarch or anyone connected to Putin's regime. But one of the ideas did materialize. You ended sure. up on the board, didn't you? So how did that come about? The way it works that uh, if uh, we, we share the same values and uh, we do various pro-family projects and we trust each other, then uh, people invite invite you on the board. It doesn't necessarily mean any financial uh, transaction or anything like this. Putin's war in Ukraine may have interrupted the growing cooperation between Western Europe's conservative Christian activists and their Russian counterparts. Indeed, Citizen Go has recently condemned Russia's invasion of Ukraine and says it ceased its activities in Russia in March 2022. But Komov remains optimistic that friendly relations between Russian and Western European conservative fellow thinkers can continue. Sanctions, they, they create uh, uh, the atmosphere of fear and persecution for uh, pro-family people who previously had been developing contacts with internationally, including with Russia. So we have to keep this in mind. So our friendships stay. And in the meantime, Mr. Oswaga and his fellow travelers in Western Europe's new moral crusade show no signs of giving up on their fight. Esta batalla la vamos a acabar ganando. Nos vemos en el campo de batalla. The freedom will not defend itself. We are the, the one that need to protect our values. If we will stand for them, we will protect them. If we will not stand for them, they are, the battle is already lost. We need to take these organizations seriously. The truce on women's rights is now broken. And that the ones who have opposed the right to abortion are now taking up arms in the way that they have not done since the 1970s. Yeah.